Oh, by my clock. Uh, my name is Max Melman. I'm a professor here, and I'm the director of the Law Medicine Center, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2013 Schroeder Lecture, which is named for Oliver C. Schroeder, Jr., who founded the Law Medicine Center in 1953 as the first law school program uh, in health law in the world. Um, to honor Ali, um, each year we bring to the law school a distinguished person in the field of health law, health policy, and medicine. Um, this year, our Schroeder scholar is Dr. David Blumenthal. Uh, Dr. Blumenthal was born in Brooklyn, New York, but has spent most of his life in Boston, where he received his undergraduate, medical, and master's of public policy degrees from Harvard and did his residency at Mass General. He then practiced primary care medicine and served on the faculty at the Harvard Medical School. He took a leave from Harvard to serve as senior health advisor to the 2008 Obama campaign, and in 2009, the president appointed him the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. That's interesting because, uh, as David admits, he doesn't have a technical uh, IT background, and in fact, his wife fixes the home computer when it goes on the fritz. Um, when Dr. Blumenthal do, uh, does have, it, what Dr. Blumenthal does have is personal experience with electronic medical records and how they can be helpful in medical practice. Um, he became what one commentator called the administration's, quote, ubiquitous evangelist for the cause and was so successful that health IT developers at an HHS press conference in 2011 called him their rock star. But Harvard only lets you take a leave for two years, so David resigned his NCO and returned to the Harvard faculty as the Samuel O. Thier Professor of Medicine. On January 1, 2013, Dr. Blumenthal left Harvard once again to become president of the Commonwealth Fund, one of the nation's foremost sponsors of health policy research. Now, uh, those of us in Ohio are uh, fond of, uh, of, of discovering Ohio connections uh, for everyone, and, um, uh, and uh, the Commonwealth Fund uh, indeed has, a Harvard uh, has, a, has an Ohio connection. Uh, the Commonwealth Fund that David now heads was founded in 1918 by a philanthropist named Anna Harkness. Her daughter Florence Harkness married Louis Severance, whose father, after whose father Severance Hall was named. Florence Harkness died 10 months after her wedding, and Lewis and her mother Anna built a memorial to her, Harkness Chapel, which sits across the street on the other side of Bellflower Road. So it's a pleasure to welcome back um, an honorary Ohioan, uh, and please join me in welcoming Dr. David Blumenthal. Well, Max, thank you very much. Max and, uh, and I began working together uh, in our youths um, and uh, uh, have uh, enjoyed uh, many sessions, actually some out here on this campus talking about issues of ethics and, and health care. Uh, so I'm going to talk uh, today uh, a little bit about um, what I see as a major policy choice that we confront as a country and which we are sliding into, uh, in fact making as we speak, though it may not have been apparent. Uh, to everyone who's uh, looking at the healthcare system broadly. Uh, and that is a choice, as this slide uh, suggests, between rationing care and re-engineering care. And I'll explain to you why I think that choice is facing us and why I think those are the paths that we are considering at this point. What I'm going to do is talk about the challenges that we face, which I'm sure will be familiar to many of you, but uh, it's always um, kind of uh, helpful to keep them in mind because of their size can be a, a kind of obfuscated by the conversation going around. Uh, I'm going to talk about the big alternatives, the two fork, the fork in the road, which I will describe to you in a moment. And then what I think of as some next steps and how the Affordable Care Act fits into those, and how some of the work that the Commonwealth Fund and other policymakers related to uh, considering options going forward uh, have been coming together in a consensus around what we need to do with our health care system. So uh, you are aware, I'm sure, of the fact that our health care system is excessively costly, that its quality does not match the expenditures that we make on health care in the United States, and that as the icing on the cake, 
we have extraordinary coverage problems, 55 million uninsured, uh, according to the latest data, and prior to the full enactment or the full implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Just to remind you, uh, if you look at adult Americans, working age Americans between 19 and 64, in 2012, 30% of them were uh, uninsured or had been uninsured within the previous year. And that number was growing steadily over time up until the, pr the, the current moment when we are watching to see whether insurance spreads as a result of the Affordable Care Act. There's also a, another problem which is hidden from view, and that is the phenomenon of underinsurance. People with insurance, but not truly insured against the high cost of illness. And if you combine the 55 million who have been uninsured in a given year with the additional 30 million Americans who are underinsured, you get to a total of about 85 million Americans with inadequate protection against the cost of illness, which is quite an extraordinary statement about a country of this wealth. Underinsurance, by the way, is a measure that the Commonwealth Fund developed and has tracked over uh, many years, and it uh, includes individuals who spend more than 10 percent of their income out of pocket on health care services in a given year. That's the definition of underinsurance that uh, we have used. It's actually for people with less than 200 percent of poverty as income, people who spend more than 5 percent of their income. One of the reasons why we have uninsurance in the United States is embodied in this graphic, uh, which is that it has become increasingly unaffordable to purchase it because the costs of care and the premiums for care have gone up at multiples of the rates of increase of wa wages uh, and of the cost of living in the United States. And since increasingly the cost of insurance within the workplace is passed on to workers uh, directly, in addition to their uh, reduction in wages that's associated with purchasing and spending on health insurance and other benefits, there's increasing direct allocation of costs to workers. More and more workers decline to purchase insurance, uh, and that's one of the reasons that they remain uninsured. Now, we also know that we have a phenomenon of shorter lives and poorer health in the United States compared to most other industrialized countries. If you look at people of comparable education and comparable income in the United States, and around the world in, in countries with uh, uh, industrialized bases and with a standard of living that uh, parallels ours, you will see that we are less healthy. Some of this may be due to obesity, but we also smoke less than other countries, so it's probably not entirely a lifestyle-related issue. The extent to which this is the result of poor health care quality remains to be established, uh, but it is certainly one of the questions that arises, and in particular, uh, not having access to any health care services, which is a, a factor in uninsurance, is probably contributing to this disparity in health across po Western populations. Another interesting thing that has emerged from work at the Commonwealth Fund is the extent to which there are disparities within the United States in health care. And what you see on this graphic is that if you look at state performance in quality of care, health status, and health status of state populations, you see that there are remarkable differences between regions of the United States. With the Northeast, the North Central United States, and the Northwest consistently performing better than the South and the Southwest, and some of the areas in the, of the mountain states. This difference in performance, which is uh, calibrated or measured by 60 variables that are publicly available in national <coughs> data sets, has been, uh, per, has been consistent over many years at, through which the Commonwealth Fund has measured uh, these uh, differences, and shows up as well as you would expect in how low-income people fare 
in the same geographic localities. So what you see here is the uh, health and health care many, using many of, this, of the same measures that were shown on the previous slide, looking at uh, how low income, do com low income populations do compared to higher income populations within the same state. And what you see is that, again, the South, the Southeast, and the, to some degree the Southwest perform consistently more poorly than the Northeast and the North Central part of the United States. One of the most telling aspects of these statistics is that if you are low income in the north central part of the United States or the northeast, you likely have better health care and may have better health than if you have higher income in the low performing states. So low income is no, does not condemn you in the United States to poor health or health care and high income does not assure that you will have good health or good health care. Where you live may be more important than your income. So we've got problems of uh, quality of care, of health status. We, of course, also have problems of cost. If we were, uh, if there was an Olympic competition for high health care costs per capita, the United States would win sweep the medals, gold, silver, bronze, hands down. Uh, higher rates of increase, higher absolute levels, uh, an extraordinary display of uh, exceptionalism, if you will, uh, uh, compared to the rest of the world, including our many high income neighbors like, uh, not neighbors, but comparable countries like Switzerland um, and uh, Austria and Germany. This combination of underperformance is increasingly weighing on policymakers. Those of you who follow the day-to-day -day ins and outs of our uh, completely paralyzed federal government may have noticed that the conversation about the debt, about the uh, funding of the federal government and the raising of the debt ceiling seems to be turning away from whether to fund or repeal or delay Obamacare to a m broader conversation about entitlements. And that entitlement conversation is really a conversation about the U.S. healthcare system and its expense and whether it's affordable. Uh, President Obama himself has said that we don't have a deficit problem in the United States, we have a health care problem. And as this conversation proceeds, as I expect it will, if not now, in the near future, there are going to be two broad choices facing the reform of our healthcare system and our entitlement programs and the, constrain, the constraining of costs while trying to preserve or improve performance. One route is the simple, easy, and fast route and the one that will undoubtedly lead the conversation if such a conversation occurs in the next few uh, weeks or months. <coughs> and that is to reduce benefits, to shift costs to beneficiaries of entitlement programs, something that, by the way, of course, has been going on in the privately insured population for quite a long time, to reduce the prices paid to providers, uh, to change eligibility requirements. All of these re result in taking things away and reducing access to care and might be loosely termed rationing, making it harder to get services that people are currently getting. The alternative is to get more for what we currently spend or to get what we currently spend, what we currently do with less, for less money. In other words, change the delivery system to make it less expensive, more efficient, higher in quality, uh, and ultimately less costly. Now, it's hard to argue that it would be better to ration care than to get more care for less money. It's hard to argue that it wouldn't be better to do fundamental delivery system reform, but the question then becomes, how do we accomplish that? 
something we've been talking about for generations. And as much as we talk about it, not much seems to happen. So how to think about delivery system reform? I'm not able to keep a lot of things in mind, so I have a very simple model for thinking about delivery system reform. It's actually a great simplification of some terrific work that was done by the Institute of Medicine as part of its landmark report called Crossing the Quality Chasm. Uh, and if you want to go back to the back, to the appendices of that volume, you will find a much more complicated and sophisticated version of what I'm going to describe to you right now. But I think of healthcare systems performance. It's performance in terms of quality and its performance in terms of cost as being the re result of the influence of microsystems and microsystems. The direct influence and the interaction of those systems. So what do I mean by macrosystems and microsystems? If you're a clinician, like I was, for uh, most of my professional life, microsystems are where you live. If you're a patient, it's where you experience the healthcare system. It's where care is provided to patients or where patients' needs are met by people directly interacting or the technology directly interacting with those consumers of health care. There are things like intensive care units, <coughs> emergency departments, hospital floors, a clinical office, an operating room and admitting department. <coughs> Systems analysts call these the sharp end, where the rubber hits the road. <coughs> now, microsystems and the people who work in them or receive treatment or care or service in them often seem to those present as though they are independent and uh, autonomous that they are not subject to external influence. But in fact, <coughs> they are influenced constantly by larger forces that bear down upon them. And those are the macrosystems. They're the organizations in which those microsystems are uh, embedded. They're environmental forces that support and influence those microsystems. So they include federal law and regulation, local law and regulation, licensing systems. They include the educational infrastructure of our healthcare system, the certifying and, and accrediting organizations that maintain or influence the behavior of our microsystems. Even things like the national boards uh, that test and certify specialists as competent to practice a specialty like cardiology uh, or internal medicine. Now, the interesting thing about healthcare is that we know a lot about microsystems. As a longtime academic, I can tell you that the reason we know a lot about microsystems is because you can study them. There are enough of them, so you can create an intervention group and a control group. And you can do an experiment with the intervention group compared to the control group, get data that's published and publishable in our eminent journals like the Journal of the American Medical Association or the New England Journal, and that ultimately will get you promoted and tenured in uh, our academic environment. And that's why one of the reasons why we know a lot about them is because they are integral to the system of scholarship uh, and promotion. And as a result of all this work, we've established that things do influence microsystem performance and can elevate it. One of the simplest, uh, which I wrote about 30 years ago in a review of the literature, is something called reminder systems. So anyone who has a significant other or children will know that if you want to change their behavior, reminding them to do something is not a bad idea. The same is true for clinicians. If you want a clinician to check blood pressure or perform a test, uh, another test on a diabetic, 
uh, or to remember to give antibiotics at a particularly critical window of time prior to a surgical procedure. Reminders have been proven time and time again to change behavior and improve conformance to guidelines. We also know that computerized decision support, which can be seen as a form of reminder but is uh, also a form of instruction and coaching at the time of clinical decisions. These are programs built into electronic health records that, remind, that uh, teach or inform clinicians about indications for tests and procedures or about optimal care at the point of uh, decision, that they also elevate the quality of care. It's been proven in multiple studies, and you can find reviews in the literature which will document it. We know that primary care in cross-national studies seems to be one of the critical factors that elevate the performance of other Western countries above the United States. The U.S. primary care system is vestigial. We have anywhere from a third to one-fifth as many primary care physicians per capita as European and other uh, advanced uh, industrial nations that perform better than we do on health care. So we know a lot about microsystems, but nothing happens with this knowledge. Uh, we spend in the foundation world, in the health services research world, uh, in the policy world, we spend enormous amounts of time standing around or sitting around tables, scratching our head over the lack of dissemination of knowledge about how to improve the functioning of our healthcare system. And you can find a whole literature on this as well. I would suggest that one of the critical reasons why we don't use what we know in healthcare is that we've failed to create macro systems that encourage the use of knowledge about how to improve microsystems and that take microsystem reform and improvement to an industrial scale. Not only have we failed to encourage it, but in many cases we've actively discouraged, actively discouraged microsystem perform improvement. The key to fundamental delivery system reform at this point in our history, and that's not to say we couldn't learn more about how to make microsystems work better, but the key to it right now is to make it easier to do the right thing to change microsystems so that it is the easiest thing to do is to imp improve performance rather than the easiest thing to do being to stay with the status quo. Now this is where the Affordable Care Act comes in because in my 40 years in this field, maybe it's only 35, um, the Affordable Care Act is the single most important intervention in the macro systems that affect health care that has ever been undertaken. Now this may not be apparent to those of you who follow the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, especially in the post-October 1 period. Most of the controversy is about the coverage related provisions of the Affordable Care Act. But there is as much ink and print and as much policy attention devoted in the Affordable Care Act to ways to reform the delivery system as there is to ways to improve coverage for health care. That's a little and, uh, known and well-kept secret, uh, but one that I think uh, offers enormous opportunities for us to make positive change right now. As a matter of fact, as a result of the Affordable Care Act, we have more tools to change <coughs> macro systems than we have had in the history of our healthcare system, really. So this toolbox is full to overflowing, includes things like uh, reduced payments for avoidable complications within hospitals, reduced payments for readmissions 
unavoidable readmissions to hospitals, bundling of payments so that hospitals would receive or uh, care, healthcare systems would receive a single payment for both the care of a patient in the hospital and their post-discharge care and potentially for physician as well as hospital care. Requirements for hospitals to report and be compensated for quality of care in those hospitals and the same for physicians. Accountable care organizations, which are the one system reform element that has gotten a modicum of attention in the post uh, in the post uh, ACA debate. And then changes in a part of the Medicare program called Medicare Advantage uh, with much tighter quality, quality ratings of uh, managed care plans that serve Medicare beneficiaries. And I threw in meaningful use here, though it's not part of the Affordable Care Act, but it is part of the macro system changes that are ongoing in the United uh, States right now. And meaningful use is one of the aspects of the national effort right now to disseminate electronic health records to providers of care. <clears throat> now, one of the problems with a full toolbox is trying to figure out which tool to grab first. And that is a big problem, actually, for people who run healthcare organizations right now. They can work on hospital-acquired conditions. They can work on bundled payment. They can form an ACO. They can become meaningful users of electronic health records. Uh, they can form patient-centered medical homes. Uh, they can do all of these things and more, but they can't do them all because they don't have the resources or the attention span. So the question is, how do you put these tools together into a synergistic program of performance improvement? And that's to some degree the challenge that we face right now. The, the Commonwealth Fund, through a commission on a high-performing health system that it has uh, maintained until this January for about 10 years, made a series of recommendations uh, 10 months ago about how to take the authorities available in the Affordable Care Act and other opportunities and weave them together into a comprehensive program of national delivery system reform. And I'm not going to go through the details of those, uh, just uh, make a couple of notes. First of all, uh, in the, the, the Commission report focused on payment reforms, on getting consumers more engaged in health care choices that they make on a daily basis, and on efforts to improve market functioning in health care generally. So just uh, just very high level introduction to the confronting cost report. One of the things that's most interesting about the current health care policy environment is the extent to which consensus has been growing about what we need to do to make delivery system reform work better. A whole bunch of organizations have come out recently with large reports, synthetic reports, uh, that have come to very similar conclusions. These include both relatively partisan groups like the Center for American Progress, uh, but also groups that are bipartisan like the Bipartisan Policy Center and the Simpson-Bowles uh, group that has uh, studied budget deficit problems for some time. The Brookings Institution also released a report that had very similar recommendations. So what are, what is the, what are the areas of agreement? Provider payment reform, paying for value, not for volume, moving uh, to support primary care more generously, by compensating primary care practitioners, whether they're nurses or physicians, more generally, more generously. Encouraging the development and, innovate and implementation of innovative delivery models, something that, are, that is actively encouraged under the Affordable Care Act through a center at in the Medicare and Medicaid programs called the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. Reforming Medicare to encourage Medicare beneficiaries to make good choices about their care through a approach called value-based insurance design, which I'd be glad to talk about uh, later, but at the same time improving the protection of beneficiaries to enable them uh, to have more integrated and coordinated care 
which right now is frustrated by the fact that the Medicare program is divided into multiple parts, which are funded differently and, and managed differently. More patient and consumer engagement so that consumers can make better choices and are encouraged to make better choices. And that means market reforms that, or depends on market reforms, that increase the transparency of information about the performance of providers and about the care available to patients in local markets. And then systematizing the billing and, and payment processes that private insurers employ so that we reduce the floors of billing clerks and billing uh, that, that inhabit both our nation's healthcare <coughs> systems and our nation's insurance companies whose only job it is to fight with one another about whether bills get paid. Now, it so happens that there's some good news about health care costs. Some of you may have heard this already, that uh, at about the time that our Great Recession began in 2008, but even starting before then, there has been a reduction in the rate of increase in annual health care costs. That affects both commercial and Medicare uh, in insureds. Uh, national health expenditure per capita growth is in the two percentage point plus range, which is at very low historically, and compared to the <coughs> CPI uh, is only uh, a couple of percent or maybe a percent and a half above it, which is also a historically low gap between the trend in consumer prices and the trend in healthcare expenditures. If that rate of, uh, and there's also good news about the spreading of some of the reforms that are included in the Affordable Care Act. So there has been much more uptake in one integrated care intervention called the Accountable Care Organization than might have been anticipated. Uh, and these are distributed not evenly across the nation, uh, but there are uh, substantial numbers of these organizations in the no in the, on the order of 400 to 500 taking root around the country and managing care in a different way than has been traditionally the case in the U.S. healthcare system. Now this good news has to be balanced against the underlying reality of our healthcare system. If the United States healthcare system were put on an island and floated out into the North Atlantic or the Pacific, it would have the fifth largest gross domestic product of any country in the world. So the U.S. would exceed its gross domestic product, as would, as would China, Japan, and Germany, though Germany not by much. But the U.S. healthcare system is largest in its gross health product, if you will, than the economy of France, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, or New Zealand. So we have a system which is immense in aggregate size uh, and creates all kinds of opportunity costs. We know that there's a huge amount of waste buried in the economy of the U.S. healthcare nation, if you will. That waste comes in many forms. It comes in the form of the administrative inefficiencies I referred to earlier, but it also comes in the uh, form of fraud and abuse, and it comes in the form of overtreatment, and it comes in the form of uncoordinated, duplicative healthcare delivery that results from lack of coordination of care in a healthcare system. The opportunity cost associated with this waste uh, is hard to get your head around. So uh, a couple of us at the Commonwealth Fund decided that we ought to think about what you could buy with the waste that is uh, embedded in our healthcare system. So one way to think about this is to ask yourself, how much money would we have saved if the United States healthcare system had uh, grown in spending at the same rate as the Swiss healthcare system over the last 30 years. 
And what you see here is that we would have saved $15.5 trillion over the last 30 years. Very hard to know what $15.5 trillion means. But some of what it means is that we could have retired our national debt and turned it into a national surplus of $3.6 trillion. We could have sent 175 million students to four-year colleges free. We could have increased spending on public health by 20,000 percent. And we could have bought everyone in the world four iPads. <laughs> so you could, have, you could do a lot with $15.5 trillion, which is, as I said, what we would have spent if our health care costs had grown at about the same rate as the Swiss. The Swiss have a not bad health care system. Uh, no one is leaving Switzerland in search of better care. Uh, so we wouldn't have lost a whole lot in terms of the quality or accessibility of care. Going forward, if we could maintain the rate of growth of health care at the current rate, as opposed to the pre-recession rate, we would save over the next eight years or so about $770 billion. So all we, in order to uh, achieve this, or avoid this opportunity cost, we just have to keep health care costs growing at the rate they're growing right now. So this is not a problem that we can avoid, even if we take heart over the last two years or three years rates of health care cost growth. Is this the dawn of a new day? Are we over the hump? Have the changes that have been made as a result of the Affordable Care Act <coughs> sufficient? Or has the reaction of the private system to fundamental delivery system reform been sufficient so that we can be confident that rates of health care cost growth and rates of health care performance will continue to improve over time? Uh, I don't think we can. I think we have an enormous job to do in terms of fundamental delivery system reform using the macro system opportunities that were created by the Affordable Care Act and others that are emerging in the private sector. That, in fact, uh, I think is the much more greater, is a much greater challenge facing government at every level and the private sector than is attaining the coverage benefits of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, and uh, while both are critical, uh, the latter will require uh, much more work on behalf of many more people uh, than making sure that our, our marketplaces work as they were intended. Thank you for your attention. I'm delighted to take some questions um, and uh, look forward to your comments and support. <laughs>
for purchasing of antihypertensive medications, diabetic medications, um, <coughs> medications that uh, control the deterioration of rheumatoid arthritis. Other things that we know are valuable and are proven scientifically. The other area where this, uh, which is more controversial, but uh, certainly uh, within this ballpark, is reducing the prices that are charged to patients and the cost that patients get, um, uh, incur if they use healthcare systems that, by objective measures, are better performing, that have better outcomes for surgery, that control illness better. Uh, we increasingly have metrics, and they're not perfect, but we increasingly have metrics that measure system performance. They're actually quite good for cardiac surgery. Uh, and so the idea that you would be have to pay less out of pocket if you used a hospital that had really great mortality statistics for cardiac surgery and have to pay more if you chose to use one that isn't so good. So those kinds of encouragements to consumers to make choices that are actually in their interests and that save the system money and let them, in effect, share in those savings uh, and at the same time encourage them to make decisions that are, um, that are in, in conformance with their interest and in societal interest. Okay. I know you're tired. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, I'd like to ask you, uh, relevant to the transparency, how do, in terms of indigent uh, uh, demographics, how do we close the gap in terms of uh, preventable diseases? As you talk about uh, these uh, metrics with uh, various different hospitals, how do we close the gap in terms of public health relevant to uh, these metrics? Because mm -hmm. it appears to be that uh, oftentimes it's put in the lap of the ombudsman or the uh, clinical director, and also, uh, also the outcome is a tort. So uh, it appears that uh, uh, there's a, a, a chasm or a bit between public and private uh, sector in terms of uh, health uh, health care deliveries in indigent populations, and in terms of uh, high rates of uh, preventable diseases and death by preventable diseases, in terms of uh, 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 coverage and uh, uh, metrics of coverage, and how they uh, are applied, because it seems to be a a, a bicorporated bi system in terms of uh, uh, various different forms of insurance. Whether it be private yep. or public, yep. in terms of uh, how these deliveries so, are applied. So, so the, the, probably the most important thing we can do to reduce disparities by income is to provide, to, to uh, implement the coverage provisions of the Affordable Care Act. Uh, adequate access to care and good preventive services start with the ability to pay for them. Uh, and I think s some of the disparities that we see in the United States uh, by income, by et race and ethnicity, do have their origin in lack of insurance, uh, on, uh, which is so prevalent in our country. Keep in mind that we have more people who are uninsured and underinsured than the population of most countries in the world. So that's point number one. I think another a uh, way of reducing those disparities is to give healthcare organizations a real incentive to care for the populations that are proximate to them. And that is one of the uh, attributes of the so-called accountable care organization in theory. Uh, it's not perfect, it has many flaws, but it's a movement in that direction. And organizations that have become accountable for the quality and cost of care for populations start to behave toward those populations very differently than they do when they are simply seeing whoever comes through the door. Uh, they start to do outreach. They start to pay attention to rates of use of preventive services. Uh, and they are driven to reduce the disparities that are associated with different forms of insurance. So those are two very concrete things, both of which are uh, part of the Affordable Care Act. That will not be sufficient. There are other things going on. Um, we know that 
one of the reasons for racial and ethnic disparities is that for whatever reason, minorities tend to use different facilities. And often those facilities are not as high in quality as the facilities that more privileged populations use. Why that happens is an interesting question that I don't fully have the answer to. <clears throat> but it may have to do with what, what facilities happen to be present in the communities in which they live. What about, uh, the last thing on the debt, I'm going to make it real short in 10 seconds. There seems to be an underlying uh, 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 implicit bias in terms of the uninsured in the emergency room. Uh, what we've seen is uh, deaths in the emergency room that people were left unattended, which caused uh, uh, quite a bit of civil losses and caused death. And there seems to be, a, a, I don't know if it's a, a, what we can say it is a, a intentional or unintentional, the bias of the uninsured in terms of what type of care and what type of billable services that we can qualify so, so for. So there's no question that lacking insurance makes you vulnerable to all kinds of um, adverse effects in the healthcare system. One of which is that you're not welcome in the emergency department. Uh, now, uh, what, how that materializes varies from place to place, and in fact, there are federal laws that require that you treat and stabilize anyone who appears, regardless of their insurance status. But there are, there's no question that that leads to other actions like the closing of emergency departments in inner cities and the crowding of emergency departments that remain open. So it's a very complicated uh, equilibrium, but lack of insurance is at the root of many of our quality and disparity problems in the, in the United States, and that's why it's so important that the Affordable Care Act be allowed to be implemented. Thank you for a terrific talk. Um, my question has to do with uh, your slide that I think labeled unnecessary care, or I might reframe that as unnecessary treatment. And I have, I have kind of two sub-questions within that. The first has to do with the distinction you're drawing between re-engineering and rationing, and, and how we might think about re-engineering to um, eliminate some of that over-treatment. And the second has more specifically to do with end-of-life care. And I, I work in this area, and, and I hear some say that's uh, imperative that we kind of decrease the amount of unnecessary end-of-life care. And I hear others say that it's such a political um, third rail that we don't want to go there. So, so I'm very interested in your, your thoughts about that component of it specifically. So uh, um, I think your first question was whether by re-engineering we can I mean reducing overtreatment, or how we'd go about doing that? Um, is that the question? Right, right, as opposed to just a, a pure rationing. Approach. Right, so uh, one of the critical ways to re-engineer our healthcare system is to create influences on the behavior of providers and patients that cause them to be smarter about the use of services. And the question then becomes how to do that. It starts with changing the incentives in the system so that you don't get rewarded for overtreatment. And that's not sufficient, but it is necessary because uh, it is an absolute fact that improvements in the quality of care that eliminate overtreatment are squelched by healthcare organizations because. The result is to reduced income, both to the individual physician and to the institution. Um, I will tell you a very brief personal story about how this might play out in a, um, in a big healthcare system where I worked, the Partners Healthcare System in Boston, where I was uh, responsible for planning our information system and for health system innovation. And a, a vendor came along with a software package that uh, he was selling as a way to uh, identify people uh, and chart and, and move people into treatment who might need a coronary artery catheterization. And the, pro the problem for this vendor was that the partner's health system had had a big change in the way it's being paid. So 40% of his patients 
in 2009-2010 were uh, at risk financially, as we, the, the system was at risk for them. So it was looking desperately for ways to maintain quality and reduce costs. It wasn't looking to channel more patients into expensive treatments. So it's, it, it might have been five years earlier, but this was a, a microsystem intervention in the form of a piece of technology that was used or not, depending on what the macro system situation was. And that kind of micro decision played out hundreds of thousands of times across our healthcare system is the way in which overtreatment is reduced and correct treatment is created and efficiency is established. And there's really no other way to do it than to have influences that encourage people to do the right thing. And that's what we're essentially looking for uh, right now in our healthcare system. So uh, I think end of life care is like any other kind of care. Um, there are some places that spend a lot of money on it and some, <coughs> spend some, case some places that don't. And uh, the, uh, the, there is a way of making end of life care more humane and more cost effective at the same time. And that has to do with using the full range of modalities that we have. One of the, it's been proven now that palliative care as an intervention saves money and makes patients happier. But saving money is not in the interests of many healthcare systems. Every hospital in the United States should have an advanced palliative care capability, makes patients more comfortable, helps them deal with the family tensions at the end of life. We don't have it because there isn't an overwhelming business case to have it. It's one of the reasons. There are also cultural issues, and uh, it's very hard for, especially oncologists, I find, to take away hope from even terminally ill patients. Uh, and there are, so there are big cultural issues to deal with as well. Thank you. My, uh, I understand it is increasingly common that people with incomes that are stressed will buy uh, high deductible insurance policies that leaves them paying out of pocket for their normal medical expenses. And when they have more costly procedures, those bills often just go unpaid. My question is, how does the system, re how does the system deal with that, and will it change with the Affordable Care Act? The way the system deals right, with that right now is that it bills patients and it sends collectors after them. Uh, and that's why medical care is, and medical bills are the leading cause of bankruptcy uh, in the United States right now. The way the Affordable Care Act deals with that is by, uh, in theory, making it possible for people to have clear choices between alternative levels of deductibles and coinsurance. So uh, when people who are eligible to use the marketplaces go into a marketplace that's well designed, they will see a limited number of choices of differing cost and differing levels of coinsurance and deductibles. And they'll have to make a choice about whether they, how much they want to pay out of pocket and how much they want to pay uh, in terms of insurance premiums. Now we're not, in this country, we don't take away that choice. That's not an American approach to solving a problem. Uh, though you or I might decide that people shouldn't have high deductibles, Americans would not be happy with that choice being made for them. So then the question is, what will happen when the dust settles and people make those choices under the Affordable Care Act where they're allowed to? where the marketplaces are implemented effectively, and they should be implemented ultimately in all 50 states. And I don't know the answer to that question because I really don't know, nor does anybody, how people will distribute their choices. So uh, we, some people are quite worried that uh, many people of moderate to low income will buy very high deductible plans that don't cover enough of their 
expenses to protect them against the cost of illness, and therefore that the uninsured, the underinsured will uh, remain high, so that the 30 million who are currently underinsured won't significantly decline. Uh, whether that happens or not, I think it's up in the air, uh, it, it, and it depends somewhat also on how many young people buy insurance. Young people may tend to buy less extensive coverage with lower prices, but may not suffer as much as a result. I'm not sure I understood your answer to the last question, because uh, only the young are allowed to buy the bronze plans. Everybody else has to buy, you know, in, in the market would buy silver or more. Uh, silver plans would, uh, on average, supposedly, cover 70% of the cost of an average person. Uh, that will involve higher <coughs> deductibles than are currently the norm in employer-based insurance, uh, but substantially lower deductibles, uh, or at least better coverage than I think you're referring to in a lot of the plans you're, uh, you're talking about people buying. So are you saying that the silver plans are inadequate coverage for many people? Uh, because that would seem to be the implication if you say you're worried that a lot of people in the exchanges will get insufficient coverage. I think that um, some of them, well, some of them may be inadequate. They may or may not be better than what people currently have. They're likely to be somewhat better. But we'll, uh, I think that, that we have to see how the dust settles. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you. Um, getting back to the, the problem of people winding up with these large bills and they get turned over to debt collectors. The hospital sells those, debt, uh, those bills or th those debts to debt collectors. Any thought to allowing patients to bid against the debt collectors for the same paper? That's beyond my competence. <laughs> um, going back to the plan design question, is there not an out-of-pocket maximum for even the silver plan? There is. Um, and that's a modem, modicum of protection. Uh, but uh, I still think that there's a lot of uncertainty about how the combination of premiums right. and uh, total costs will add up. You know, th those out-of-pocket maximums <coughs> still could be burdensome right. for lots of individuals. Um, uh, thank you. My, my question as far as uh, delivery system reform, development of uh, EHRs, um, centralized information with, with all the benefits in terms of providing care, uh, doing research through the identified information and whatnot. Um, can, can you address concerns as far as uh, health privacy, specifically in the behavioral health field, security breaches, um, that type of thing? So uh, we live in a, a world where privacy is increasingly difficult to maintain. Uh, and there's no question that if you put electron information in electronic form uh, and you aggregate it into large databases, uh, and if identifiers that enable you to link the data to a particular individual are associated with that data, that there are threats to privacy. Uh, the benefits that counterbalance those threats are substantial. Uh, and uh, actually, people who use the healthcare system most tend to be least worried about the privacy problem, with the exception of people who have substance abuse and uh, mental health problems, uh, who tend to be much more acutely concerned. We do need to have special technical protections to safeguard the privacy of substance abuse and mental health, behavioral health related information, though it is an incredibly difficult problem to solve. If we could solve that problem, I think a lot of the concerns, at least the, sh the balance of concern, would shift much more toward 
the confidence in the electronic health record and the electronic digi the digital information age in healthcare. But there are uh, there also are a series of legal and regulatory changes that are needed to adapt our privacy statutes uh, and our security statutes to the modern age. You may not know this, but there's been uh, there's a huge controversy right now in Washington about protecting the cybersecurity of our vital IT infrastructure. I'm talking here about finance, energy companies, the transportation system, uh, and uh, critical uh, data such as the data that resides in the defense industry. Uh, and the Congress has been unwilling to legislate higher standards of cybersecurity for commerce in general and for private sector organizations in general. Uh, that same, uh, that, that willingness to create greater, a greater floor under the protections that are part of the private sector, I think would have to occur within the private sector, within the healthcare industry as well, because the extent that we exchange information using the internet, we inherit all the problems of openness and lack of security that are part of the uh, internet as we know it. So the, uh, we need a, a higher level of security in a legal framework and a regulatory framework to assure that security uh, than we currently have. And it's running up against an ideological opposition to greater government involvement in the affairs of citizens. In this case, it's not the classic individual libertarian opposition, it's more a business, the opposition of businesses who would have to expend additional funds to raise their level of cybersecurity. I think we have to stop now. Thank you very much, David. <laughs>